Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be studying simple spin systems, or equivalently, coupled qubit systems. This will build heavily upon the work we did in the last lecture, where we considered the properties of a single spin half particle. There we saw that we had a two-dimensional Hilbert space, basically the up or down spin. We talked about the operator algebra for a single spin, uh, we saw that we have these different operators which do not commute and the, uh, the consequences of that operator algebra in terms of setting up the states of the system. In this lecture we'll consider especially a two-spin system and to be able to do that we'll need to understand how we can combine two uh, isolated subsystems containing a single particle and bring them together in a single combined system. For two spin half particles of course we'll have a four-dimensional Hilbert space and we'll talk about the structure of this space uh, in terms of the complex vector spaces associated with the bases. We'll talk about the operator algebra and we'll talk about quantum numbers, especially for spin, the total spin of this system. We'll talk about different kind of uh, uh, operators that we can apply to basis states. And indeed, we'll talk about the nature of these basis states themselves, whether or not they are eigenstates, for example, of a given Hamiltonian or eigenstates of a uh, given quantum number operators. We'll see that in general, a product state basis which are basically consist of uh, classical states, are not going to be uh, eigenstates of, a, of a generalized operator or indeed a generalized Hamiltonian. Therefore, we might wish to choose our basis carefully uh, so that we do uh, have a basis which is described by certain quantum numbers, for example. Indeed, we'll see that solving the quantum mechanical many particle Schrodinger equation is actually equivalent to just a clever choice of basis we go from the classical product state basis, for example, uh, to the eigenbasis of a given Hamiltonian. So in this lecture, we'll be studying in detail the idea of a, uh, a basis transformation and how to do that in a formal way and how to generalize it to many particle systems. This is all going to be important stuff for what we'll consider in the later lectures, where we'll build up the complexity to much more interesting systems, not just one or two spins, but really materials involving many, many spins uh, and we'll be, be able to use this formalism to describe properties of magnetism. So let's get down to work. Before we discuss in this lecture the formalism for two spins, or two qubits, let's recap the formalism for a single spin-half particle. First of all, we note that we have a two-dimensional local Hilbert space spanned by basis states. This means that for a single spin-half particle, we have an up or a down spin. In Dirac bracket no notation, this up and down spin are given by these kets. We simply use an up arrow to indicate the up spin and a down arrow to indicate the down spin. These are the two states that span the local Hilbert space for a single spin half particle. We can then obtain the corresponding bras in the Dirac bracket notation from these kets we simply take the adjoint, or the conjugate transpose. This gives these bras, uh, which I denote like this. The adjoint, or conjugate transpose, um, is denoted by this dagger symbol here. And we can obtain the corresponding bra for a given state from the ket by doing this dagger operation. This basis of up and down spins for a single spin half particle is complete and orthonormal. These are important concepts, so let me revise them quickly. When we say something is complete, it means that any and all states of our system can be described as linear combinations or superpositions of these basis states. More precisely, we can identify an identity operator, one hat, um, which is expressed in terms of the uh, bras and kets in the following way. We have um, first the bra on up and then the ket on up, and we add onto that the bra on down and the ket on down. And you can easily verify, as we did in the previous lecture, that uh, any conceivable state, when acted on by this identity operator, um, yields the same state back again. So um, if this is true for all possible states, then the basis is complete, and this is referred to as the resolution of the identity. We also must have that the basis is orthonormal, Mathematically, that's uh, described by this inner product here of the, the bra and the ket. 
we see that this is given by the Kronecker delta function of sigma sigma primed. What that means is if sigma and sigma primed are the same, then this is equal to 1. And if sigma and sigma primed are different, then this is equal to 0. So for example, if we were to take the inner product with an upspin with an upspin, we'd get 1. The downspin with a downspin, we'd get 1. But an upspin with a downspin would give us 0. So this actually describes two features of the basis. One is that a given state is normalized. If we take the inner product with itself, we get 1. On the other hand, we see that different states are orthogonal. An up and a down state, for example, are orthogonal. This is important because when we want to describe a given state of our system in terms of this basis, uh, we don't want to have any overlap between our basis states. We want to have them as independent variables or independent directions along our complex vector space. So a basis must be complete and orthonormal, and we see here for this local two-dimensional Hilbert space spanned by up and down states for the single spin half that that's the case. The next property is that these basis states are actually eigenstates of the spin angular momentum operators. So I can define a, uh, a spin vector operator here. It's a vector with three components, x, y, and z, and these are this, uh, the spin operators in the x, y, and z directions. We can also define total spin squared, s squared hat, simply as the dot product of these vectors, which of course in component form would be sx squared plus sy squared plus sz squared. It can then be shown, as we discussed in the previous lecture, that if we apply s squared to a generalized state of spin s and spin projection, sz, then we get s into s plus one um, as, an, uh, as an eigenvalue times the state back again. If we apply SZ to this state, then we get SZ times the state back again. So what we see here is that a generalized state labeled by S and SZ are eigenstates of the total spin operator S squared with eigenvalue S into S plus one, and also the SZ operator with eigenvalue SZ. So specializing now to the particular case at hand with a single spin half particle, if we apply S squared to the upspin, we will get 3 quarters times the upspin back again. Why? Because the eigenvalue is s into s plus 1. So for an s equals half particle, that number is 3 quarters. If we apply s squared to the downspin, we get the same. And that's because the up and down spins are still spin half particles. When we talk about up and down, we're referring to the z projection. The spin itself is still s equals a half. On the other hand, if we apply the SZ operator, then we get SZ as the eigenvalue. And here we have a convention that the upspin has an SZ value of plus one half, whereas the downspin has an SZ value of minus one half. This is then somehow intuitive because the upspin is plus a half, downspin is minus a half. Just bear in mind that when we use this up and down spin uh, cartoon notation, uh, this really means that we have a spin half particle with an SZ of plus or minus a half. In uh, property four here, I mentioned that the spin S and the spin projection SZ are actually quantum numbers. This is important. It tells us that we can write down a simultaneous eigenbasis for a given state of the spin and the spin projection. And that follows from the property that s squared and s z commute. I can compute this uh, commutator here, and I would find that it was identically equal to zero. That means that we can form a simultaneous eigenbasis and label states by, by uh, s and s z at the same time. Now, if we're talking about electrons, which are spin half particles, uh, in most of this lecture, we'll just drop this, uh, this s label uh, because we're always talking about spin half particles. On the other hand, they can come in two flavors, up and down spin, and so typically we uh, denote the states of a single spin half particle just by their SZ component. And, as we've just discussed, instead of writing SZ equals plus a half and SZ equals minus a half, we just have this simplified cartoon notation of an up arrow or a down arrow. But just bear in mind the, the deeper implication of what this means. Finally, we introduce spin raising and lowering operators. These are ladder operators similar to the situation in the quantum harmonic oscillator. These are defined as s plus or minus, respectively, for the raising and lowering operators, 
and they have some particular form in terms of the SX and SY uh, spin operators. However, the important thing to remember is uh, simply this intuitive one, which is that if I apply the raising operator to a downspin, then I get the upspin. If I apply the lowering operator to an upspin, I get the downspin, hence the names. However, there's another important uh, property, which is that if I try to raise the spin of something that's already an upspin, I get zero. If I try to lower the spin of something that's already a downspin, I get zero. This means that we're confined to the two-dimensional Hilbert space. If I try to go outside of the up and down spin Hilbert space, um, I get zero when I apply these raising and lowering operators. Again, when I talk about raising and lowering the spin, I'm really meaning the spin projection here. All the time, we have a spin half particle in mind. S plus and S minus just change the value of S z. Finally, let me mention that we can express these operators, these spin operators, in terms of the Dirac brackets. In particular, the S plus operator that raises the SZ uh, can be simply thought of in this way. We have a down bra and a up ket. So if I were to come along um, with a down spin, it would turn it into an up spin. If I were to come along with an up spin, it would give me zero. This is just following from these uh, orthogonality and uh, completeness conditions in property number two here. Likewise, uh, the S minus operator can be written in this way. If I come along with an upspin, it gives me a downspin back again. Similarly, with the SZ operator, I have one half of up minus down. So if I come along with an upspin, it gives me uh, plus a half of the upspin back again. If I come along with a downspin, it gives me minus a half of the downspin back again, which is exactly the properties that we require um, from these uh, original definitions here. So these operator uh, expressions will be handy and we'll be exploiting them in this lecture. Okay, so what I've summarized here is basically all of the formalism, everything we need to know for a single spin half particle. What we'll do in the rest of the lecture is uh, generalize this to two spin half particles. Um, we'll go through this in detail but the structure that we set up will be easily generalizable then to many particle systems, which is of course the point of this course. So let's now consider two spin half particles labeled A and B. Notice at this stage, we're not specifying any Hamiltonian or model or system. We're just going to study the formalism and the operator algebra. For spin A, we either have an up or a down, and I'll denote that using these kets here, uh, we have an up and a down as before, and then I'm labeling these kets by the particular spin that I'm talking about, A, in this case. Likewise, we have an up and down for the B spin here. I will describe these in terms of the SZ quantum number. So for spin A, we can have um, an up or down spin denoted by SZA is either plus or minus a half. Likewise, um, for spin uh, B, we can have SZB is plus or minus a half for an up or down spin on site B. This is the situation for individual particles A and B, but now what we want to do, of course, is talk about the collective state of the combined AB system. Now we will define a single ket for the combined AB system. I will denote it in terms of the individual quantum numbers SZA on the A spin and SZB for the B spin but this will be a single ket here. I'm no longer writing A and B subscripts outside of the ket. This is for the combined system. This object is defined as the direct product of the vector spaces for A and B. What I mean is that I have an individual ket for uh, the spin A, and I have an individual ket for state B, and I can take the direct product of these two to obtain uh, this single ket for the combined system. This generates a four-dimensional Hilbert space. This is the complete vector space for two spin-half particles. And to make it more clear what I mean by this, let's just enumerate all four of these possibilities. You'll see that it's very simple. I can have an up-up on our combined system, and that is defined as being an upspin on site A combined with an upspin on site B. Likewise, we can have an up-down state of our combined system, which is obviously 
therefore an upspin on site A and a downspin on site B. And I can just enumerate all four of these possibilities. And it gives us, of course, the complete space for two spin half particles. So hopefully this is not too mysterious. It's just a formal way of writing out the different possibilities for two spin half particles. Notice that these are basis states. These are not yet any eigenstates of any Hamiltonian. We haven't specified a Hamiltonian. There is no model or physical system in mind. At this stage, we're just setting up the formalism to describe such systems. And as usual, we can obtain the corresponding bras from the kets through taking the adjoint or the uh, conjugate transpose. Symbolically, we denote that in the following way. We take a particular ket for our combined AB system. We take the adjoint or the dagger of it and it gives us the corresponding bra. What does this mean, therefore, in terms of the individual A and B systems? It's almost what you'd expect. Notice, however, that the order of A and B gets switched when we go to the bra versus the ket. That's because um, this adjoint operation, this dagger symbol here, means the conjugate transpose. We should really view these things as kind of matrices, and you know that when you take the transpose of a product of two matrices, you get the product of the transpose of those matrices, but the order is switched. And that's exactly what we see here. The B now comes first and the A second. For this to be a good basis, we know that it must be orthonormal and complete. So let's first of all take a look in more detail at this orthonormality condition. In our combined AB system, we can think of two generalized states. I specify a particular ket, an arbitrary one, in terms of the quantum numbers for SZ on the A spin and SZ on the B spin. I can then think of another arbitrary state. I'll label the bra for that state in terms of quantum numbers SZA primed and SZB primed. For the basis to be orthonormal, it implies that the inner product of this bra and ket must be equal to these delta functions. In particular, we see that we have here a Kronecker delta for SZA and SZA primed. That tells us that we need the same Z projection for the spin in the bra and the ket on the A site. Here, we have a Kronecker delta for SZB and SZB primed. This means that we need the same Z projection in the bra and ket on the B site. All of this means that we only get one on the right-hand side here from the product of these two delta functions if and only if SZA is equal to SZA primed, and if SZB is equal to SZB primed. Any other combinations of spins here, we would get zero. As an example, if we were to compute the inner product of the same state up down with up down, we would get one. Whereas if we compute the inner product of different basis states up down with, for example, down up, then we would find that to be zero. Let's now prove this important property, starting from the definition of our combined AB system in terms of the direct product of the vector spaces for the separate AB states, and from the orthonormality of the individual systems A and B, as we considered in the last lecture. We start by writing out the bras and the kets for the combined AB system in terms of the individual states of spins A and B as follows. We're using here this adjoint property that I mentioned on the previous slide. And now we can simply use the orthonormality condition on the A and B states individually. For example, here, we see that we have the inner product of an upspin with an upspin on A, and that gives us one. So we can then collapse this part of the product here using that uh, one there to obtain simply now the inner product of the down state with the down state on the B side. And again, we know from the orthonormality condition for spin B that this is equal to one. And so the whole thing is equal to one. This is what we wanted because we're comparing a state with itself. The fact that the inner product is equal to one here shows that the state is normalized. Let's consider another example. Let's consider the inner product or overlap between the up-up state and the up-down state. We proceed as before by writing this out in terms of the individual A and B systems. 
With this now written out in full, we can now compare what's going on on the A and B spin separately. First of all, let's consider A, which is in the middle here. We see that we have the inner product of an upspin with an upspin on A, and that gives us 1. Therefore, we can collapse part of this product and write now that we have the inner product on B of the downspin with the upspin on B. And this is actually equal to 0. And therefore, the whole thing is equal to 0. And that is correct. We don't want there to be any overlap between different states. You can then do this for all possible combinations of our AB system, and you would indeed find that this relation here was satisfied. We only get a 1 for this overlap or inner product if we're talking about the same state in both bra and ket. <clears throat> we get 0 otherwise. If we have a different state in the bra than the ket, then we get 0. You may also have noticed here that when I'm writing out uh, the states of the combined system in terms of the A and B system separately, I've actually omitted this, uh, this cross product symbol. Uh, that's just for brevity. It's implied by this notation. To establish that this is indeed a complete basis, we need to write down our identity operator. This is this one hat thing here. We do this by resolving the identity, and this is the result. I can write that the identity operator is the sum of projectors onto all possible states of the system. I can also write this as the direct product of the identity operator on the A system with the identity operator on the B system. To make this more transparent, let's just write it all out. This identity operator um, involves this combination of bras and kets, and in the bra and the ket in each term, we have the same state. That's why I refer to it as a projector. For example, if I were to come along and operate uh, with this term on the up-up state, then it would return me up-up. If I were to come along uh, with an up-down state and operate with it on this term, I would get the up-down state back again, and so on. So the fact that I sum over all possible states of the system means that uh, when I apply the one operator to any state in the system, I get that state back again. For it to be a complete basis, we know that we should be able to express any conceivable state of our system in terms of this basis. So as a stringent test of this, let's suppose that we have some arbitrary state here. I've uh, picked as an example psi as 1 over root 2 of up, down, minus, down, up. This is a superposition state rather than the product state, and we'll talk more about these kinds of states in a moment. But the task here is to compute explicitly what happens when we act on this arbitrary superposition state with our identity operator. If it's a complete basis, then it, this should return to us uh, psi again for any uh, definition of psi, actually. But let's take this particular one as just a case in point. So let's go ahead and compute this. So let's now just substitute in the definitions of our identity operator and our psi state. So when we write it all out, we obtain something like this. I've color coded things here for ease of reading. So uh, everything that is related to the identity operator I'm writing in red, everything that's relating to the state psi I'm writing in blue. So we see in red here the identity operator, and I'm acting uh, with that upon the components of this state. So first of all, I look at 1 over root 2 of the up-down, which are the uh, kets here, and then I subtract from it on the second line um, the identity operator acting on the component down up in the ket, which is what you see here. Now we can use the orthonormality conditions that we've just established to strike out certain of these. So for example, here we see that this must be equal to zero because we have an inner product, or an overlap if you like, of states uh, which are different in the bra and the ket. Uh, likewise, this one is different, likewise this one is different, this one is different, and so on. In fact, only two of them survive. We have this one, which is equal to 1, and this inner product, which is equal to 1. And so we're left uh, with a state, which is 1 over root 2 of up, down, minus, down, up which is correctly our state psi back again. 
So for this particular example, at least, we've identified that if you act on this state with the identity operator, you get the state back again. So this identity operator doesn't just work for the original basis states themselves, but actually any linear combination of those, which can be eigenstates of a given system. Let's now consider the spin operators acting on the combined AB system. First of all, let's suppose that we have some spin operators, uh, SZ, S plus, and S minus, that only act on the A subsystem. For example, we want that the spin lowering operator on the A subsystem acts independently of what's happening in the B subsystem. If I act with SA minus on the up up state, I will generate the down up state. But likewise, if I act with SA minus on the up down state, I should obtain the down down state. That's because we're lowering the spin on the A subsystem independently of what's going on on the B subsystem. In this first example, the B is an upspin, and that remains an upspin. In the second example, it's a downspin, and B remains a downspin. But in both cases, the A subsystem is changed from an up to a down. In fact, because we're just talking about two spin half particles, and each of those particles can either be up or down, these are the only two possibilities for the lowering operator acting on the A subsystem. We can therefore express the spin lowering operator acting on the A system, uh, SA minus, in the following form. In this first term, we see that the up up state would be converted to a down up state. That basically follows from this first relation here. But then we have another possibility, which is that the up down state can be converted into the down down state. And that's encapsulated in this second equation here. If I now write this out in terms of the direct products of the vector spaces for A and B separately, I would obtain this expression. And then I can actually factorize this. In both of these two terms, the A system is converted from an up to a down. In the first term, we have an up in the B. In the second term, we have a down in the B. We can now recognize this object in brackets here is the identity operator for the B subsystem. And indeed, in this first term here, we have the spin lowering operator for a single spin. So overall, the spin lowering operator for the A subsystem of a combined two spin system comprises a piece which corresponds to lowering the spin on the A subsystem, and then the identity operator acting on the B subsystem. The logic here is that we do something to the A subsystem but we leave the B subsystem alone. In an exactly analogous way, we can define a spin lowering operator on the B system. From these defining equations, we can then construct explicitly that SB minus is the identity operator acting on the A subsystem, and then the lowering operator on the B system. The spin raising operators on the A and B subsystems and the SZ operators on the A and B subsystems work in exactly the same way. In this way, we can work out how all of our spin operators act on all of the basis states of our system. For example, if I act with SA minus on the up up state, then as we just saw, this generates the down up state. If I act with SA minus on the up down state, it creates the down down state. However, SA minus acting on down up gives me zero as does SA minus acting on down down. That is because the A spin is already down and can't be lowered further. Similarly, I can write down how SB minus acts on all of our basis states. Likewise, I can consider what happens with the SA plus operator and the SB plus operator, as well as the Z operators acting on the A and B subsystems. This basically defines the full spin algebra of our two spin problem. We have a four-dimensional Hilbert space, we have therefore four basis vectors, and we've considered the operation of these individual spin raising, lowering, and Z operators on those four basis states. We can now define operators for the total spin of our combined AB system. Let's define a total spin operator S tote vector hat here as being the sum over the spin operator S vector hat for the A and B subsystems. Written out in component form, we have a three-dimensional uh, vector in space with x, y, and z components, each of which are just the sum of the operators for the A and B subsystems, as defined on the previous slides. 
We can also define um, total raising and lowering operators simply as the sum of the raising and lowering operators acting on the A and B subsystems. And a total SZ operator, which is again simply the sum of the SZ operators on A and B. For example, if we act on the up-up state with our SZ total, we will obtain SAZ acting on up-up plus SBZ acting on up-up. This first term gives us plus one half of the up-up state back again, and the second term likewise gives us plus one half of the up-up state back again. And so overall, this is plus one times the state up-up back again. We see that the up-up state is actually an eigenstate of this SZ total operator. Likewise, if we act with SZ total on the up-down state, then we actually get two contributions with opposite signs, plus a half for the SAZ acting on the state, but minus a half for the SBZ acting on the state. In the end, these cancel, and I get zero. We'll discuss this more in the next lecture. Now let's consider S total squared. As usual, this is defined as the dot product of the vector operators for the total spin. By definition, this is therefore SA vector operator plus SB vector operator dotted into itself. And we can expand this out we would obtain SA squared plus SB squared plus twice of SA vector operator dot SB vector operator. It turns out that we don't have to worry about the order of operation of A and B. One can see that directly from the definitions of the operators given above. Now, we can actually make a further simplification of this because we're talking about spin half particles. We know that S squared acting on a spin half state gives us an eigenvalue of three quarters. That's S into S plus one. If we're just dealing with spin half particles <clears throat> and we have here individual operators for the A and B spins, then we can actually write that this object will always give us three quarters independently of whether the Z component is up or down. And likewise on the B side, we will obtain three quarters, independently of whether the B spin is up or down. Therefore, overall, we can write that the total spin operator S squared is three halves plus twice of the dot product of the spin operators on the two sides. Let's now consider this operator in a little more detail. It's SA vector dot SB vector. The overall object is a scalar quantity. As we'll see in the coming lectures, this is an object of central importance and corresponds to the coupling between two spins. For now, let's just study its properties more abstractly. In component form, we can write out the dot product in this way. Doing the dot product, we obtain this scalar quantity. Now, if we use the definition of the raising and lowering spin operators in terms of the x and y components of the spin, then we can write everything in terms of the SZ operators and the s plus and minus operators. I will leave it as a simple exercise for you to confirm that this original expression here in component form, when taken with this definition of the raising and lowering operators, yields this important result. This is a convenient form for the operator because when we label the spins as up or down, that's actually of course the z component of the spin and the raising and lowering operators act on the up and down spin states. For example, when we act with SA.SB on the up-up state, we can write that in terms of these three contributions. Each of these terms involves uh, the product of two operators acting on this combined AB state. It is easy, however, to deal with this product of operators. We simply apply each of them in turn onto the state. For example, SBZ acting on up-up gives us one half of up-up back again. SB minus acting on up-up gives us the state up-down, whereas SB plus acting on up-up gives us zero because the B state is already up. So in the second step, we have one half of SAZ acting on the up-up state plus one half of SA plus acting on the state up-down. 
The second of these states, of course, is simply zero, whereas the first one of these gives us again one half of the up up state. And so overall, we see that the action of this operator onto this state gives us the state back again with an eigenvalue of one quarter. Similarly, if we apply sa.sb to the down down state, we again get one quarter of the state back again. This actually arises because we have minus a half times minus a half is equal to plus a quarter. Both of these have eigenvalue plus one quarter. Let's now look at the action of sa.sb on the up down and down up states. In the case sa.sb acting on up down, we have the following three contributions as before. The first term gives uh, plus a half for the first spin and minus a half for the second spin. Overall, that gives us minus one quarter of the up down state back again. The second term vanishes because we can't further lower the B spin or further raise the A spin. But this third term is now non-zero because we can raise the B spin here and lower the A spin. That basically flips both of, both of the spins, turning us from the up-down state to the down-up state. So overall, SA.SB acting on the up-down state does not give us um, the state back again. We now get a linear combination of states. We see it's minus one quarter of up-down plus one half of down-up. So the state up-down is not an eigenstate of the operator SA.SB. When we apply it to a single state up-down, we don't get that state back again. Similarly, if I were to apply SA.SB to the down-up state, then we see this is also not an eigenstate. We get minus one quarter of down-up back again, but then we also have plus a half of the up-down state. We get, again, a superposition of states. So we've seen that when we act with the operator SA.SB on either the up-down or the down-up states, then we generate a combination of up-down and down-up in both cases. Therefore, it stands to reason that we might be able to take a linear combination of these states, which are eigenstates of the operator. Let me define these new states, plus and minus, which are respectively the even and odd combinations of the original up-down and down-up states. First of all, we should confirm that these are valid basis states. What I mean by that is we can show that if we were to calculate the overlap or inner product of the plus state with itself, we would indeed get one. If we calculate the overlap of the minus state with itself, similarly, we get one. But if we calculate the overlap between the states, plus minus or minus plus, this is equal to zero, they're orthogonal states, and they're also normalized states. So indeed, this is a good basis transformation. We will talk more about basis transformation shortly, but for now, simply take it as read that we've defined new states, plus and minus, which are uh, linear combinations of our old states, up, down, and down, up. The new plus and minus states uh, do constitute a proper basis. However, notice that these new plus and minus states have no definite value for the z-projection of the a and the b spins. We see that in one of the components, the a spin uh, is a spin up, whereas the a spin is a spin down in the other component. So we cannot label this state by a definite value for s, a, z. Likewise, we can't label the state by a definite value for s, b, z. In the first component, the spin is down, in the second component, it's up. What this tells us is that s, a, z and s, b, z are not good quantum numbers to describe these basis states. The plus and minus states are a superposition of the up, down and down, up states. They are entangled states, not product states. A product state phi is defined as being something where we can write a direct product of a state of spin A times the state of a spin B. Now notice that these linear combinations of states are not of that form. These are not product states, and therefore they're entangled states. 
we will quantify the notion of entanglement uh, in a future lecture by considering the so-called entanglement entropy. For now, let's see how SA dot SB acts upon these new plus and minus states. Using these definitions, we can now apply SA dot SB to the plus state, for example, and we can write that as this sum of terms here. Going through these terms, we see that this one is immediately equal to zero, and this one is immediately equal to zero. The other four terms are finite, and I've written them out here. In fact, we can collect up these terms and uh, tidy up the algebra a bit. We'd see that it factorizes. We see overall a factor of one quarter times one over root two, up, down, plus, down, up. And of course, the nice thing is that this is exactly one quarter of the original plus state back again. So we see that indeed this plus state is an eigenstate of the operator SA dot SB. We get the plus state back again with an eigenvalue of one quarter. Okay, so let's repeat this procedure now using the minus state. Applying SA dot SB to the minus state, we see something very similar, except now on the second line, we have these relative minus signs between these terms. That's coming because of this minus sign in the definition of the minus state. This then follows through to a change of signs here and here. We've changed the minus to a plus on this term and a plus to a minus on this term. Tidying up the result a bit, we see that we get minus three quarters this time, times one over root two, up, down, minus, down, up. And again, the nice thing is this can be expressed back in terms of the minus state. SA dot SB acting on the minus state gives us back the minus state with an eigenvalue of minus three quarters. So, by performing this basis transformation from the up-down and down-up states to the plus and minus states, we've discovered that the plus and minus states are eigenstates of SA dot SB with eigenvalues of plus a quarter and minus three quarters. So let's summarize the information that we found. We see that the basis states up-up, down-down, and the plus and minus states are eigenstates of the operator SA dot SB. In particular, when we operate with SA dot SB on either the up up, the down down, or the plus state, we get the same eigenvalue of plus one quarter. Whereas, when we act with SA dot SB on the minus state, uh, we see that we get an eigenvalue of minus three quarters. The first three states are referred to as a triplet. This is because these are three degenerate eigenstates, they have the same eigenvalue. This last state is called a singlet because it has a unique, non-degenerate eigenvalue. The multiplet structure of these eigenstates is of course not an accident, it's to do with the overall spin of the system. The triplet is a combined spin 1 state, whereas the singlet is a combined spin 0 state. Why is that the case? Let's imagine that we have these basis states. I'm writing up, up, plus, minus, and down, down. Bear in mind that the plus and minus states are themselves even and odd linear combinations of the up, down, and down, up states. If we were to apply the total SZ operator onto these basis states, we would see that these basis states are indeed eigenstates of SZ total. That means that when we apply SZ total to the up, up state, we get the up, up state back again with an eigenvalue of plus one. When we apply SZ total to the plus or minus states, we get the states back again times an eigenvalue of zero. Whereas when we apply SZ total to the down down state, we get the down down state back again with an eigenvalue of minus one. Even though the plus and minus states do not have a definite value for SZ A and SZ B, they do have a definite value for the combined Z component of the spin, SZ A plus SZ B. And since the plus and minus states comprise up, down, and down, up states, the total SZ is equal to zero. What about the action of the total S squared operator on these basis states? Well, recall that the total S squared operator for two spin half particles is actually given by three halves plus twice SA dot SB. And we've just shown that these basis states are eigenstates of the operator SA dot SB. Furthermore, we worked out the eigenvalues. Therefore, we can immediately conclude that these basis states 
are in fact eigenstates of the S squared total operator. From the eigenvalues we calculated on the previous slide, I can now simply write down that S total squared acting on up up gives me twice the up up state back again. And we get the same eigenvalue of 2 for the plus state and the down down state. However, we get an eigenvalue of 0 for the S total squared operator acting on the minus state. Recall that the S squared operator acting on a state of spin S gives us the state S back again with an eigenvalue of S into S plus 1. Therefore, we can now conclude that these three states all have the same spin, and if S into S plus 1 is equal to 2, then this tells us these are spin 1 states. Whereas if S into S plus 1 is 0, then that must be a spin S equals 0 state. We now see why there are three degenerate states in the triplet, because we have total SZ of plus 1, 0, and minus 1. These are the three Z components that we can have for an S equals 1 state. We also see why the spin 0 state is unique and non-degenerate, because here we have a spin 0, and therefore the only SZ value we can have is also 0, as we see on the left-hand side. So these basis states are in fact eigenstates of the S total squared and S total Z operators. This means that we can label our basis states according to this total spin S and the total SZ. I can therefore label the basis in this way according to the quantum numbers S and SZ, where here S and SZ are the total spin and spin projection of the combined system. So this is, of course, consistent with our knowledge of the rules for addition of angular momentum. If we start with two spin-half particles, then the combined system can either be a spin 0 or a spin 1. Let's now look in a bit more detail at this concept of a basis transformation. In the previous slides, we took the up-down and down-up basis states and formed a new basis from them of the plus and minus states. This is an example of a basis transformation. In general, quantum mechanical states are superpositions, or linear combinations, of classical product states. So far, when we enumerated our basis, we just considered these classical product states. Now, we would like to consider the wider space of the linear combinations of these basis states. Any complete orthonormal set of states can be used as a basis to describe the eigenstates of a given operator. This operator could be the Hamiltonian, and the eigenstates would therefore be the wave functions, but the operator could also be some other operator, for example, the total S squared operator we just considered. In the latter example, the plus minus states are the eigenstates of the S squared operator, um, and they're given as a, a linear combination of our basis states, which are the up down and down up states. Going from the up down and down up states to the plus minus states is referred to as a basis transformation. Indeed, the problem of finding the wave functions for a given Hamiltonian can be viewed as a basis transformation as well. We want to find the particular linear combination of our basis states, which give us the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Those are the wave functions. The eigenvalues are the energies. So the concept of a basis transformation is very important in quantum mechanics, and therefore we'll devote some time to studying it in more detail now. Superpositions are really linear combinations. Therefore, we can use the standard machinery of linear algebra to help us. In particular, the relations between different basis sets can be described by matrix equations. To see this, let's define a vector, or actually more properly a row matrix, describing the basis. Here I've introduced this phi vector, which is uh, this four component object involving our kets, up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. This vector contains all of our basis states. It's the complete set. And here, we're choosing as our most basic definition the basis involving product states. These are kind of like the classical states. They are not yet superpositions of states. We can now perform a basis transformation from phi to a new basis, psi. This is brought about through a transformation matrix U. I write that psi vector is equal to phi vector times the matrix U. 
Here I'm denoting vectors with the arrow on the top as usual, and a matrix will be denoted with this double line underneath. Let's suppose that our new basis, psi, is the up, up, plus, minus, and down, down basis. This is the basis we considered on the previous slides. We showed that the basis psi actually are eigenstates of the S squared operator. So in this example, we know the original basis phi, and we know the new basis psi. What we want to do is work out the relationship between these two, and that should follow this matrix equation here. In particular, what is the matrix U which brings about this transformation? To be able to do this, we need to remind ourselves of how the plus and minus states look like in terms of the original basis. Here is the definition. The plus or minus state is given by 1 over root 2 up down plus or minus down up. With this information at hand, we can determine the transformation matrix U. In this case, the matrix U takes this form. In particular, we see that the matrix takes a block diagonal form. That's because this top left block here corresponds to the transformation from the up up state to the up up state. Nothing happened, therefore we simply have a 1 here. It doesn't get entangled with any of the other basis states. Likewise, the down down state converts to the down down state in the new basis. That's this bottom right uh, entry here. However, we see this middle block in the matrix here, which is a two by two matrix. And this is the one describing how the up, down, and down, up get uh, scrambled up to obtain the plus and minus states. Because states of the old basis and the new basis must both be orthonormal, this actually implies a special property of the matrix U. It implies that the matrix U is unitary. What that means is that if we take the matrix product of u dagger with u, we get the identity matrix. In this case, the 4 by 4 identity matrix, because u is a 4 by 4 matrix. Another way of putting that is to say that the inverse matrix, u inverse, is actually given by the conjugate transpose of the original matrix. So we see here that the basis transformation can actually be viewed as a matrix transformation. Just as I can rotate a regular vector in three-dimensional space by multiplying it by a rotation matrix, similarly we can think about basis transformations in quantum mechanics as a rotation in the n-dimensional complex vector space. Of course, what I have showed you here is how you can define a transformation from one basis to another in terms of a particular matrix equation involving the transformation matrix U. However, the usual problem in quantum mechanics is the opposite one. We usually start from a given basis, for example, the product state basis, and we have a Hamiltonian. And we want to find the new basis, which is the eigenbasis of this Hamiltonian. This basically boils down many particle quantum mechanics to finding the basis transformation from the original product state basis to the eigenbasis of a given Hamiltonian. It basically means finding this matrix U for a given problem. And we'll consider how to do that explicitly in this course. On the previous slides, we looked at basis transformations for the specific case of a two-spin system. Let's now have a look at the general case of basis transformations. First of all, let's consider some arbitrary but complete and orthonormal basis spanned by these kets phi i. This basis will have an arbitrary dimension we won't just confine ourselves to the four-dimensional local Hilbert space of a two-spin problem, as we've done previously in this lecture. The goal here is to be more general. Mathematically, we can understand the completeness of the basis in terms of the resolution of the identity. In this case, it means a projector onto all of the basis states of the system. And the orthonormality of the basis means that these inner products here are equal to the Kronecker delta. If i is equal to j, this overlap is equal to 1. If i is not equal to j, then the overlap is equal to 0. We proceed as before by identifying a vector phi which comprises all of our basis states. For a quantum system of n degrees of freedom, we therefore have these kets phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, all the way up to phi n. Consider now the product phi vector dagger phi vector. Remember, the dagger means conjugate transpose. 
phi vector dagger therefore becomes a, a column matrix uh, containing all of the bras for the basis states. The product phi vector dagger phi vector is therefore this object, and we can do the matrix product. Writing it all out, we obtain a matrix with these following matrix elements. The individual matrix elements are themselves the inner products of the various basis states. Because of the orthonormality of the basis, we can see that only the diagonal entries in this matrix will give us ones. All the off-diagonal elements of this matrix will give us zero. This matrix product is therefore equal to the n-dimensional identity matrix for a system of n degrees of freedom. We see that the condition phi vector dagger phi vector equals the identity matrix is actually equivalent to the orthonormality condition stated here. However, we'll see that this matrix representation of the condition will be useful when considering basis transformations in a moment. Okay, so let's now consider the opposite matrix product. Let's consider phi vector times phi vector dagger. Here, the objects are in the opposite order from last time. When we write it out, we get something like this. Because we now have a row matrix multiplied by a column matrix, the result of this matrix product will give us a scalar quantity. When we do this, we see that we have a scalar object, but now not of matrix elements or inner products, but actually of operators. We have the bra and ket of phi1, the bra and ket of phi2, and so on. Indeed, the sum of all of these things is precisely equal to the identity operator, one hat, as defined here. Again, this is a nice matrix representation of these two important properties of our basis. So let me summarize. Defining a vector phi as a row matrix of our original basis states, phi 1, phi 2, and so on, up to phi n, then if we take phi vector dagger phi vector, and we get the identity matrix, then this means the basis is orthonormal. On the other hand, if we take phi vector and multiply it by phi vector dagger, and we get the identity operator, then that means the basis is complete. So let's now assume that we start with a complete orthonormal basis that satisfies these conditions. Now let's perform a transformation to a new basis psi, which is obtained by multiplying our old basis vector phi by the transformation matrix u. Using this definition, we can now form the products as before, psi vector dagger psi and psi vector psi vector dagger. Writing this out in terms of our phi and u, we obtain the following. In this first example, we see the product phi vector dagger phi vector, which we know is the identity matrix. If we were to sandwich the identity matrix between u dagger and u, we would simply obtain u dagger u. The identity matrix drops out when we do the matrix product. For the new basis to be a legitimate basis, we would like it as well to be orthonormal and complete. That means that when we form this product, we must obtain the identity matrix. And when we form this product, we must obtain the identity operator. We see now what properties of the matrix U we must have to achieve this. If U dagger U is equal to the identity matrix, then we have fulfilled this first condition. Also, if U dagger U is equal to the identity matrix, then we can insert the identity matrix here for the product U, U dagger. That would then mean that on the second line, this was equal to phi vector phi vector dagger. The identity matrix again drops out, which we know from the original basis is actually equal to the identity operator. So both of the conditions are met. The new basis psi is orthonormal and complete, provided that u dagger u is equal to the identity matrix. This is the same as saying that the transformation matrix u is unitary. In fact, that's why I chose the letter u to emphasize that it is a unitary matrix. We will be using this concept of a basis transformation that preserves the orthonormality and completeness of the basis extensively in this course. The concept of basis transformations is central to actually solving the Schrodinger equation in many particle quantum mechanics. In general, the problem in quantum mechanics is that we have some Hamiltonian H 
and some basis denoted here by these uh, phi kets. We want to find a new basis set given by these psi's such that the Schrodinger equation is solved, meaning that when we act on a given state psi with the Hamiltonian, we get the state psi back again, multiplied by an eigenvalue, which is of course the energy of that state in quantum mechanics. So solving the many particle Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics is equivalent to finding the transformation that takes us from our original basis, let's say the classical product state basis, to the eigenbasis psi of the Hamiltonian. We'll be exploring in detail in the next lecture exactly how to do that.